I'm Al Phil Reese, and this is Poem Talk at the Writer's House, where I have the pleasure of convening three friends to collaborate on a close but not too close reading of a poem. We'll talk, maybe even disagree a bit, and perhaps open up the verse to a few new possibilities, and we hope gain for a poem that interests us, some new readers and listeners. And I say listeners because Poem Talk poems are available in recordings made by the poets themselves as part of our Pen Sound archive, writing.upen.com. Dot edu slash pen sound. Today I'm joined here in Philadelphia at the Kelly Writers House in our Wexler studio by Bruce Andrews, the Chicago-born language poet and political scientist who co-edited Language Magazine from 1978 to 1981 in New York, who since the 80s has collaborated with choreographer Sally Silvers, and who has, wh- whom I should say is in the room, hi Sally, and who has published dozens of poetry collections among them, just to name a scant few, Designated Heartbeat, I Don't Have Any Paper So Shut Up, or Social Romanticism, Lip Service, Praxis, Vowels, whose incredibly vast pen sound page includes performances of poetics, series, and sequences such as Tizzy Boost, Dizzyistics, Dang Me, Rock and Rule, one of my favorites, and more, and whose 1970s correspondence with Charles Bernstein and Ron Silliman can now be read in print in The Language Letters, published in 2019. And by Rachel Blau Duplessis, poet, essayist, collagist, teacher, mentor to several generations of poets and feminist critics whose selected poems 1980 to 2020 was published in a beautiful volume by Chax Press, released in September 2022, and still excitingly, fabulously, triumphantly new, really, as of this recording. We're so happy about it. And whose many, many other books include The Long Poem Drafts, The Pink Guitar, Writing as Feminist Practice, The Selected Letters of George Oppen, Writing Beyond the Edge, just to name a few. And by William Fuller, Bill Fuller, who at my last count has published eight full-length books of poetry, among them Daybreak 2020, Playtime 2015, Hallucination 2011, Ether 1998, and BYT, his first, I think, published by O Books back in 1989, who has joined us here today all the way from Chicago, and I should say has co-curated this episode of Poem Talk with me, thank you, Bill, whose prose poem, Never Said, begins, quote, if you were to stop today, no one would notice which I just want to say is not at all true in his case. (laughs) Bill, you came the furthest from this group. Thank you. Hello. How are you? Thanks, Al. Hello. I'm fine. Good. And I just want to say for the record that by the time this episode emerges, people can go to your Pen Sound page and see and hear a whole new section of poems. Tell us one thing you read from that people will want to find. Uh, I read from the book Daybreak. Came out in 2020, I believe. I think there was something going on, a pandemic or something. Right, so it didn't get the distribution you wanted. Well, and... you know, I, I, once I was able to travel to the post office, I sent it to a few friends, and that's and I have pretty a much what happened somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce, Sally. Hello to both of you. Hey, Bruce. Hey, hey. Good to see you. And Rachel, I see you often here at the writer's house, but it's good to have you behind the mic here. Yeah, thanks. So today, the four of us have gathered here to talk about a book-length poem by Ted Pearson, Catenary Odes, published by O Books, first in 1987. The poem covers 44 pages in print, and we'll today be discussing the first 11 pages, approximately 40 lines. For poem talkers following along with the text, our section ends with the body electric in a brownout, the Western mind in a jar, which is, I just have to say... (laughs) Great lines. Our recording comes from Pearson's Pen Sound page, the audio taping of a reading given in the Segway series at the Ear Inn in New York on December 4th, 1993. I think probably one of us was in the room, very po- possibly Bruce was there. Um, maybe two, maybe Sally was there too. Uh, that day, uh, Ted Pearson read the entire poem, and we highly recommend it to Poem Talk listeners. The section we're going to discuss takes three minutes and 56 seconds into the recording. Note that the tape, as it came to us, needs some volume boosting and was marred or maybe enhanced, depending on your point of view, by the ambient sounds either of the ear in or we think maybe the other, a previously made recording on the cassette. It's possible, right? So we don't know what this uh, paraphono text 
that, but it's there. It's something you'll hear. And we've somewhat cleaned up the audio. We just wanted to note that. We haven't altered the original that's available on Penn Sound. So here now is Ted Pearson reading from Catenary Odes. At home, and not in paradise, purview, the wild iris, hard pan pipes, a pygmy forest, believe I'll dust my broom. The art of poverty could boast broad dominions, esteemed colors, scarce glory. Beating time to the goon ictus, onyx, momboid, eschatology. Presumption suckles fast from matrix, the cleft path to free will. Anechoic, the devouring din, the technology exists to record. Half carrion, half specter, the catalog raisonné, the lives of the poet. Lies splintered from perjured heaven speak to the whole these figures mend in us. The affairs of infinite tradition elate rare strains of fictitious blossoms. Nude under all that stitchery reascends a stairway to the stars, hips, syncopation, fat back drums, du temps. Scarce laid in adjoining nights, skunked alterity buries by the dream. Sleep's surrogate scrolls the continuum, memory vamps to unpretending time. Symmetries of the innate sentence, the trial by error, the period ends. Blameless seed of endowed tropics, uncertain transit, essential oils. Who most mistake the real, forgive it. Crosstown traffic, island life, each thing equal to the shape of its moment, dressing Edenic meat. Not by volume, but whiff of death, a trend too tapped to prove. More than a field, the generic grew, thick with civil solids. Distance balks coherent mirrors. The glad day publishes grief between tears. Anode, the body electric in a brownout, the western mind in a jar. <laughs> Let's each of us take a stab at a first question, which is, what is the unit of organization we see visually on the page? And for Penn Sound listeners, our program note will include some the best scans we can make so that people can see this visually. But... There are, you know, they look like couplets spread way apart. Um, Bill, starting with you, how do you describe this this unit? Does it make sense as couplet length poems separate? How does it work for you? So, my first acquaintance with Ted's work was the book previous to this called Mnemonics, which basically had two lines at the top of each page. So when I got this, I said, oh, he's doubled it. He's doubled down. He's got one at the top and one, at, one couplet at the top, one at the bottom. I think the idea is that these are individual poems um, that are part of their – it's a serial poem. That is to say they proceed in, you know, in serial order. And he views this 
as a whole, in other words, the catenary olds as a whole, but each one is a part which is a whole within it. Bruce, Rachel. So the question arises, what is seriality? And then what is the organization between fragment and whole, and whether whole is a concept that is W-H-O-L-E, a concept that works with Ted's work and whether there are different kinds of surreality actually described, mm-hmm. because the first one that you describe is probably a serial poem that is the one that just had couplets, and that's it. But the second one doubled it, which I was very amused by, because one does experience this as quite minimalist, which raises the question, is it, and what is minimalism, and where does Ted want his work to be received in relationship to those questions, which are several, actually. There's also a ton of white space between the two, which should be noted. I have been obsessed of late with a binary between modes of forming and modes of meaning possibility. And I've detected in the trajectory, historical trajectory of experimental writing in the 70s, a shift from one toward the other that what my colleagues and I started out with as a kind of radical semiotic formalism uh, gradually took on greater interest in the world outside, discursive, social, prose, prose, longer phrase units, et cetera. So Ted, I think, is setting up a kind of allegory of the relationship between form and meaning possibility. And at the top lines are strikingly, to me, about formal possibility. And the bottom of each page is strikingly about a kind of critique of the pretentiousness and the – it's almost a takedown of, of the formalism in, embedded in the first uh, – in the upper part of the page. And so it creates a kind of dialogue or conversation or what Sally Silvers, who's – sitting behind me having my back, <laughs> literally in the seating <laughs> position here, uh, she told me was call and response. Hmm. The bottom, the critique part, the meaning emb- embodiment part, which is about you know, the outside, the context, the, the particular, the concrete, the, the, you know, the kind of democratic, the body, the blood, all these things are part of what going on in the bottom, churning around on the bottom, that in this later phase of many of my peers' work, that response gets embodied in the call itself, so that the call gets changed by these possible response of what's meaningful and embodied and groove and, you know, all this this vocabulary in Ted, which is in in the bottoms of the pages. Wow. Okay. Bill, can we take Bruce's suggestion and find... I mean, Bruce can find it because he has something in mind particularly, but let's find a page pair that does what Bruce described. Well, let's start at the beginning, I think. Okay. I mean, and, and that's a fascinating insight, Bruce. And I I think when I first read this book, I must have I registered at some, that point because we start off with at home and not in paradise, purview, the wild iris. We have a kind of lofty sense, paradise, the wild iris, the spring, et cetera. It's then, also poetic in some Correct. Expected sense. Yeah. And then the corresponding couplet at the bottom is hard pan pipes, a pygmy forest, believe I'll dust my broom. It's responsive. Elmore, jo- Elmore James. Yeah, I was actually intrigued by the at home in the wild iris. It's the only time he seems to be in, the re- in re- realism, in a kind of, you know, well, here we are. I'm, I'm the eye. I see my wild iris. I'm at home. But in the next, by the time we get to the broom, um, it's very dismissive of poetry, of the normal normative poetry of the expressive and so on. But I'd be really interested in another example of another, from, from Bruce. I'm fascinated. Yes. Um, rather than just taking the beginning, which is, you know, Bruce, find another one of these for us. Like another place where it really 
is the commentary. Well, clearly, the second page. Second page. <laughs> okay. Look yeah. at the bottom. Beating <laughs> time oh, to the yeah. goon Ictus. I didn't. I didn't, didn't look up Ictus, but clearly. Ictus the, is a strong beat. Okay, perfect. So beating, beating time, time, and you have momboid eschatology. So yeah. you know you have this exoticizable ethno onyx ma- possibility. momboid eschatology. Yeah. That doesn't sound too minimalist to me. I suppose it's, but that's. I'm getting like yeah. a little hard um, hard play here because I don't understand to even begin with esteemed colors and how that can go with the art of poverty, okay? Which the other the other places seem to go. So it is more realistic, but then well, esteemed go- colors is this you know pretense? You know, the, wh- where does the esteem come from? Does well, the esteem come I'm right asking. in I'm- right fr- from itself, right out of the you know? Right out of literature, or uh, does it come from below? Does it come from the bottom? And he says the you art know? of poverty could boast broad dominions. Right. It presumably doesn't. Could boast broad dominions, well, esteemed it, it, colors, scarce glory. Well, it certainly boasts scarce glory. Yeah. What if we were able to find a relationship between the first couplet, the top couplet, and the bottom couplet by way of sentence flow or grammar? For instance, half carrion, half specter. The catalog raisonné, the lives of the poets, lies splintered. But yeah. it doesn't work because it's not a verb. Uh, it could lives be a don't it, lies. Yeah. But still, can one read down to form a call-response binaristic sentence, possibly? We have perjured down below, which probably... I mean, I don't think, I don't think this is consistent throughout this manuscript... I mean, I think it's I think it's a very valid insight, and I think it does give a sense of what Ted is going through at this point. His work is clearly becoming a little more uh, fragmented and atomistic, and I think ultimately the notion of these being catenary odes, which we haven't talked about, but must soon, yeah, um, is kind of that's the linking mechanism, the catenary. I mean. Like, say more. So, or how would you take it? Um, so, the catenary um, would be, for example, like the velvet rope at the movie theater, so hanging down, the U shape, the gravity forms, and it has these two fixed points. So, I think um, it's a curved shape that is a balance, but uh, f- its shape is formed by its own weightedness. Correct. Something like that. Gravity, right. So, to the extent that one of the top is one point from which the catenary extends to the bottom. So there is a relationship between them that's kind of physical that's designed here. And it's also, as he's republished his poem later on, where he shrunk this the space. Uh, very dramatically, but it's still there. So, I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily very helpful, but I do think that that's part of what, you know, one takes away here. You, you're thinking about a catenary, what's being connected? Well, in regard to what Bill just said, I, I have notes on each of these pages, and I could make a case for every single one <laughs> <Okay>. fitting, fitting, <laughs> fitting my I abstract my schema. Hand. <laughs> but I also think that the, the language, based on what Al was saying about the, the grammar and the pacing and the structure of the sentence, there's not that much difference. I find the tops and the bottoms to have the same kind of atomized language. A little for, I mean, I, I have a sense that Ted operates in his writing the way I do, which is to accumulate short little things and, and then collages of them together, you know. But I don't, I don't find that the bottom is any less um, fragmented than the tops. Right. But I think that the, I have to the, say the, I totally heard you, not in the way this is read, but just as I was reading it. I heard the s- stuff that you've done in the last 10 or 15 years, and I really heard the resonance. And, you, and that resonated with you. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, and I heard him on the tape actually laughing at the last line. So I think. Well, I think everybody. Can, can <laughs> we say why people laughed at the last line? It's not the end of the poem, but it's the end of our section. I mean, it's just funny, right? The Western mind in a jar. An uh-huh. ode. So uh-huh. obviously you've got electricity and an ode. The body electric, Whitman, in a brownout. The Western mind in a jar. So the jar is Stevensian, I guess. It's almost it's like supposed, collecting electricity. It's Stevensian, but it's also like, you know, something in, floating in formaldehyde. A brain. 
I think know, that's what he's thinking. And also, the anode. I, I, when I looked up anode, it yeah. talked about it. One of his meanings was the the negative electrode in a battery. Now, the negative electrode is the is the bottom. It's right. the butt. Right. And the positive electrode is the little the little head top, and that's the F. And the bottom is this. That's on the bottom. It's the meaning. Bruce, so, what does your card oh, wow. say about the final? Page of our passages, distance box, etc. Can you literally read your notes? Sure. On that? Let me see what I got here. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you keep track of all glad that. Glad day we got. Well, it's, the pages are different too. Well, I mean, the body electric is what is what is electrifying. That's what's electrifying, and even if it's in a brownout, and the the the, the display case of meaning or the possibilities of meaning with the Western mind. It, it's it, it's trying to turn it into a display case, you know. It's already it's already it's in a jar, you know, and it's not universal. It's contained in this vi- visible container, which is accessible to formalizing, um, and yet everything's being pulled. Everything pulled in from the bottom is what threatens the self satisfaction of the formalism, the glad day, you know. And instead, it solicits it to publish. These less positive feelings, tears, grief, you know. So does the bottom response, I'll I'll turn to Rachel on this, does the bottom response get the final word because it's at the bottom? It's the catenary, it's at the bottom of the... See, I don't believe that the catenary goes that way because a catenary by definition is these wires or velvet rope that curve because of gravity. And if you posit that the top and the bottom are related catenarily, so to speak, what you have is a big white space. You have a drop. You have that wire or a piece of string would not take the shape of the catenary, which is, by the way, illustrated in this little handbook. So I just think it's a little more complicated. I put because it's a title word, I put catenary with ode, and I get quite an interesting mess is basically what it is, mm-hmm. because odes typically, I mean, there's the Greek ode, you know, it goes back and forth on the stage. It goes a little bit this way, then it goes a little bit that way, then it right. stands still. The ode is completely opposite to these poems. That is, an ode is a kind of calling out, um, a, almost hysterical of desire for vocation, for, you know, a touch of the sublime and so on. And so I, th- I really think of these as imploded odes that are somehow linked. The catenary might be, I mean, the catenary is a very strange word to find here, especially because of the physical. It well, evokes physicality in a certain way, but then it doesn't quite deliver in the way that you were describing. Well, I mean, you have to turn the book on its side, right? I know. Right. That, right. I so, couldn't I mean, there's think no, it. There's no oh, up and oh, down in no the two ends. There's no book on its side. I see. If we do that, are you being serious? <laughs> that, well, yeah, no, I mean, if we do is. that, if we serious. do that, then the, they, are, they are the poles and the space is the thing the, that yeah, yeah. hangs yeah. down. But I, I, that answers my question confess, about— Let me confess, I have— the inside of the catenary is linking them directly from the author himself. All right, right. go ahead. Yeah, because they, ahead. they wouldn't they wouldn't droop, right? If you put right. it on its side, that would stretch the it would stretch the line out. But there's a link also between an ode as as a way as a path. It's an odos, right? right? Odos. Right. So right. that's in the can. etymology of ode, which uh-huh. is also an homage. I wrote down that's something that shows respect for or celebrates the worth or influence of another. Right, so if it's an imploded ode, then it is in fact getting closer to this notion of a critique. You know? Yeah, but it's also there. There really are two things. You've evoked the language side, that is, language poetries, whatever that means. But um, you can you also the, evoke. Let the record show. There yeah, was some let the air record show. <laughs> there were um, what is it? Scare quotes or little but air quotes? That's just, why I call it so-called language. The so-called, clear, the so-called, so-called, language, language. so-called. But to be clear, right. Ted would have been interested in that. Oh, absolutely, for sure. because of, of it's very clear that he had a tremendous. Um, critical and intellectual and uh, commitment to language poetry, as you can see by his participation in the very important grand piano uh, uh, ten volumes of of discussion. But the other commitment that he had was um, an objectivist commitment. And he is very, at the beginning, indebted to Oppen, not so much here, but his first, um, the first work in evidence, which is a book of 10 short poems 
published by Gaz Press, which is a, a sort of early, an early selected of his poems. The first poem in that book is incredibly indebted to um, Oppen's of, uh, of, of being numerous, if I'm not mistaken, in fact, with direct quotes. So you have to talk about Ted in an objectivist as well as in a language poetry mode. Well, if we were talking about Ted's entire trajectory in his career, which we're not. Well, we're not, except insofar as it's evoked here. Uh, Bill, you have the trump card. You talk to Ted. Oh, don't use that word. What? I talk to Ted. On, just on the cat... Horse's just, mouth. Just on the... Uh, what did he say The question interest? of the catenary. I don't know if it's interesting, but he basically said, no, the catenary links the two lines within the couplets, and then it links the couplets to one another. So it's a whole wire system. Yeah, it kind of, kind of is. And I always thought he was talking about a catenary, like a power line or something like that, which would kind of... By the way, go catenary your... is a noun. You've yes. all been using it as a noun, but here it functions right. as a modifier of odes. That's right. correct. Yeah. yeah. You said earlier, and maybe this was just a throwaway line at the very beginning of a podcast, and we're not supposed to go back to it, but you did say <laughs> that these poems, these couplets could stand. It's possible to think of them as... Poems, one poem at a time. Yeah. So can you pick one randomly or not randomly and tell us how that might work as a, not standalone poem, but as a poem that someone could encounter? Or for instance, let's say somebody was doing an anthology and wanted to pick three or four of them and pitch them as poems. It would ruin the whole catenary thing, but it would be something. Yeah, well, as I, as I was trying to articulate, I see them as being not only parts of a whole, but holes in themselves. So even the one that we've just, we were just talking about, um, beating time to the goon ictus, onyx, momboid, eschatology. I mean, can I, I read can read that as a poem. Please? I can read that as a poem. Can you do it now? I was trying to do it then. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Comes all the way from Chicago and I'm browbeating him. Yeah, I'm what sorry. the hell? I'm sorry. Beating time to the goon ictus, onyx, mamboid, eschatology. I mean, it's kind of like in a station of the metro or something like that. There's a kind of rhythm in a number of these that are like that. Um, but so I, I kind of read it that way. I don't, I mean, I... You're talking uh, about just the bottom part? Just the bottom part. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's very haiku-like in the way the grammar works from the first line to the mm -hmm. next line. So beat, beating time becomes a kind of long uh, line length modifier that then we get to the main. Or, or there are thing. things that are really kind of separate little vignettes here. So at the bottom of the next page, anechoic, the devouring din, the technology exists to record. Like a definition. Yeah, and I'm not sure what, I mean, anechoic that brings up John Cage and uh, and silence and being in the anechoic chamber and only hearing your nervous system and your heartbeat. Um, but somehow that seems to be of a, of a separate set of concerns, which you could link back because we're clever. Um, but it, <laughs> it seems kind of in itself a little meditation on that. So it does work to see them as if one were teaching this before one got to the whole to the whole series, one could invite one's students to try it one haiku at a time. Or one line at a time. Or one line at a time. Sure. And many of these little phrases could be pages on the, on, by themselves. So is it minimalist? It would be minimalism to me only if a two-word cluster or a three-word cluster or a four-word phrase or part of a phrase were just existing by itself on the page. You know? uh -huh. So mm -hmm. then, it so has if to it's be, a if it's a collage it's a, made up of little parts, then I don't consider that minimalism. Okay, well, can you define? I mean, in other words, because it, it's a whole that is, it has been stuck together in in some way that is pleasing. Well, I don't I don't know that anything is a whole. Yeah, with well, a W. But I'm trying w, to you know? distinguish. You know, because if you ha if you have so many of these little phrases seem to evoke, as you said, a whole lot underneath. It's as if they're the tip of an iceberg. And then there's a, you know, like for me, I was stuck on goon ictus because I love the word goon with mm -hmm. the word ictus, since goons are like strike breakers and an ictus is a strike. That mm -hmm. is, you strike mm -hmm. something. Yeah, nice. And I'm like, 
mm, mm, you right. know, I, yeah. I was really taken with that. Any and you can time. do that with a number of them, mm-hmm. like cleft path suggests cleft palate. So there's a number of ways that this language is generated. Do you know what I mean? Like it could be by association or by right. kind of a way of of putting a definition together or an aphorism or something like that. To me, it's creating a network. Yeah. You know, and that I don't quite think of that as minimalism. It, well, I guess when I read, I, I see these sort of like Feynman-like vectors, quantum mechanics, the things flying all over that because there is that sense of possibility with each phrase. And so, Bruce, from the standpoint of a whole, I mean, every for me, a whole with a W is riddled with holes with H. <laughs> okay. That's, that's okay. super and nice. So this. All right. But this. so when it, when does it not become a hole with a W? You know what I mean? When do, does it does it seem like as if it wants to be that and doesn't get there? Or does it seem as if that's an irrelevant question? Or like can you fail to be a hole? I think it's, an, I, I think it's irrelevant. a dynamic question within work like this. Um, and getting back to seriality, I do think that that's the way in which uh, Ted views his work. And he, he was very specific to me when I asked him about that. He talked about, you know, this is very definitely one piece, mm-hmm. but each piece is separate. And so it just caused me to kind of think, well, to what extent um, does that affect my reading? And Or to what extent is that not always true? Well, it's true. With so much of his work or many of our work. Mm-hmm. You know? There are moments when the focus on the form of the piece itself, so it's metaformal, or on language itself becomes foregrounded. I'll give you an example and maybe we can talk about it. It's fairly far through, maybe halfway through our s- section, s- top, a top couplet. Symmetries of the innate sentence, the trial by error, the period ends. <laughs> yeah. Thoughts on that? Well, the limits of formalism, to me, in page 229 of Evidence, the version I'm reading it from, is putting a stop to any improvisatory rummaging around, any trial by error, hmm. you know, or or even whether error is possible, you know, and and the the period then is authorizing this straight and narrow phenomena which ends all experimentation within the sentence. So then we're getting closer to Ron Silliman's notion of the new sentence or we're getting close, you know, as different from sentences that don't have that uh, normative familiar ring to them.